Hello, I'm the Irish guy, and right, that was another crazy Premier League game week with huge consequences. So let's just see, let's just see what happened in the Prem catch-up, starting with Arsenal. Right, let's go. Arsenal 2, Brentford 1. Poor old Aaron Ramsdale. Lads, when you're having a bad day, when you burn your toes, when you trip over your shoes, when you accidentally vacuum up your hamster, this is a man who a year ago was dreaming about becoming a Premier League title winning number one, while his England rival was going to be relegated to the championship wormhole. If all things went accordingly to plan, then Ramsdale would become the first English goalie to win a Premier League title as the number one in nearly 10 years and would absolutely be in line to be England's first choice goalkeeper at Euro 2024. Instead, he's now just some nervous Arsenal substitute who only gets wheeled out to play Brentford. That's his only purpose in life. He's played Brentford three different times this season. I mean, forget Jason Statham. This bloke is the true big keeper. And do you know what's embarrassing? When the Gunners travelled to Brentford in November, even then he was sloppier than a pig eating pizza off the floor. He received a back pass that night, dallied on the ball, and was robbed by Ewan Wiesa. I mean, Declan Rice had to clear the ball off the line. Arsenal had been warned because it's four months later, and that is exactly exactly what happened again. Ramsdale receives the ball, and look, I know he only maybe took about two seconds on the ball, but I mean, in the fast pace, Premier League Elite Football, the biggest league in the world, two seconds might as well be longer than the third Lord of the Rings. He tries to clear it, and once again, smashes it off Wisa, and this time it goes in. This man who's gonna be 84 years of age, slumped in a nursing home being fed banoffee pie, and is still gonna be scared of Wisa robbing his lunch. I feel so horrible for Ramsdale, because we saw in that Arsenal Amazon documentary, that is a man who looked disgusted, even if the gun one, but somebody had spoiled his perfect clean sheets. So yes, I mean, Kai Havertz saved his bacon at the weekend, but make no mistake about it, that fella would have been up at night, weaving into slice after slice of chocolate toast. Now he's just going back into hibernation on the bench for the rest of the season. It's harsh. Even Michael Bublé gets the entire month of Christmas. This is it. This is Ramsdale season. It's over. Between September and May, his Premier League resume is just... Two shaky games against Brentford. Do you think that's really going to impress Garrett Southgate? It's embarrassing. It's a bit like trying to apply for a job at a prestigious New York bank. When your CV just consists of seven months of working at McDonald's. Before getting fired after you're caught on CCTV. Rubbing chicken nuggets on your sack. How could they tell who I was from the back of my head? Being out in the cold as a goalkeeper is a lot more fatal for somebody's career than if you were just benched as a striker. Because goalkeeping vacancies do not come up much at all. Do you think Ramsdale will be able to go out there and get another team on par with Arsenal? Yeah. How did that work out for Joe Hart when Man City no longer wanted him? Um, within two and a half years, England's number one was warming the bench at Burnley. There is one move in the summer that saves Ramsdale's career. Go and sign for Leicester City. I mean, this will feel like a step back signing for a newly promoted club, but Leicester are a special club. And ugh, I talked about Joe Hart a second ago. To me, nothing separates him and Kasper Schmeichel. It was a toss of a coin who City would have chosen as their number one goalie 15 years ago. Such similar characters, personalities, leadership, qualities. Hart would not have looked out of place winning the league at Leicester City. And between 2010 and 2016, Michael would have looked out of place as City's number one. I think he was that good. So go and fill Schmeichel's shoes at Leicester Ramsdale. They've been looking for a long-term goalie ever since he left. To me, this is the move that saves Ramsdale. But lads, before we move on, what an important win for Arsenal, right? They are now top of the league. But they shouldn't be. I respect the job Mikel Arteta has done at the club. And if he actually adds his name to the list of Premier League title winning managers, it'll be extraordinary. And yes, Arsenal are sitting top of the league in March. But they really should not be. If the referee decisions were done properly, which they should be now that we have VAR, then I'm sorry, but Liverpool would not be behind the Gunners on goal difference. They would be four points clear of them. Because first of all, Liverpool should have been given a last gas penalty against Man City after a Jeremy Doc who showed the world that he's clearly been watching too many Jackie Chan films. But Arsenal, Kai Havertz scores an 86th minute winner. Should not have been on the pitch. He was already on a yellow card, then dives in the box, and the referee doesn't give the penalty. So he's admitting he thinks it's a dive too. But Havertz stays on the pitch. This is one of my biggest bugbears in football. Uh, that's a weird word. Bugbear? Who do I think I am, Roald Dahl? But whenever I see a referee fail to book a player for diving because they're already on a yellow card, I automatically assume that that referee is probably too insecure to take off his t-shirt at the beach. I automatically think that that referee has the backbone of a moldy salmon pie. Yes, it would be a big call to send Havertz off at 1-1 in the middle of an intense title fight. He's probably seen the scary Arsenal fans vomiting anger on the internet. Maybe Robert Jones is scared of bumping into the judges when he's buying flowers for his mum. But I don't care. Havertz should have been gone. He should 
should have been off the pitch. We want to stamp diving out of the game, right? Well, then there needs to be a punishment. A yellow card is exactly the type of deterrent you want. Don't feel sympathy for the German. He was the one who stupidly threw himself to the box in the floor. With zero contact when he's already on a yellow. It's his own stupidity. Havertz should have been off the pitch. Honestly, Arsenal, they should have spent the last 20 minutes clinging to a 1-1 draw with 10 men. If I'm a Brentford fan, no, sorry, if I'm a Liverpool fan, then after that weekend of stupid decisions, then I am livid. Both Havertz and Doku were extremely lucky boys, along guessing most tabloids would have preferred if those two had swapped their crimes, because then they could have run the headline, Cobra Kai! Hilarious. West Ham 2, Burnley 2. Poor old Burnley. Minutes away from a crucial win. And the guy who scores his first goal in over a year is the bloke who used to play up front for them. Burnley made Danny Inks. I mean, losing him to Liverpool in 2015 was such an awkward, uncomfortable, protracted scramble. It took nearly a year for Burnley to get their 6.5 billion pounds through a tribunal. It was like such a horrible, lengthy divorce where even after a year, the couple are still squabbling about who gets to take the goldfish. I mean, don't give it to the husband. He just plans to eat them in a baguette he stole from Greg's. Poor old Burnley minutes away from a crucial win and then Ing scores and he also smashes the bar minutes later he could have scored the winner wow seeing your former player break his year-long dock with two goals in injury time I know Burnley supporters are hard and steely orcs but even they would probably start trying to bite off their own fingers to numb the pain Burnley could not afford to give up two points here they couldn't this, this is so damaging to their survival hopes. Their relegation predicament looks scary. It's quite fitting, really. I mean, Ings is an anagram of Sing. And after his equalizer, that's exactly what the fat lady is about to do. I mean, a better song of choice is all about that bass. Oh, sorry, that was me. I feel sorry for Ings. There's a man who looks sad coming off that pitch. Probably because he just proven to himself that he still got it. So why then had it been a year since his last goal? Why does it always look like he would prefer to eat a paperback copy of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire than give this man minutes on the pitch? Poor old Wilfred Zaha. Ings is also inexplicably out in the cold. And yet nobody is accusing him of getting off of Moisey's daughter. I mean, to be fair, that poor woman is probably now about 42. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really garner that much interest in the Gotham column when the woman is now too old to even have a baby. Ings does Deserves more minutes on the pitch. He's just been restricted to five 10 minute cameos off the bench. The guy's not 37 years old, he's 31, and he needs just another 29 goals to join the Premier League 100 goal club. Ah, to be fair, no chance in a snake's stomach is Ings ever joining that club. He has about as much chance of sneaking into that exclusive club as I do of getting myself invited to the Caprio's next birthday party. Ah, they. They're not able to instantly smell the poor off me. But again, Inks, that man should replace Jimmy Vardy at Leicester City next season. Again, I know, I'm just trying to match fix every sad sap with Leicester right now. Those fans will not thank me for trying to fix them up with miserable, tragic milk muffins such as these. I mean, I'm not gonna suggest next. You bring in Kirk Van Eften on the wing? But honestly, Inks is the perfect, solid, short-term replacement for Vardy. Similar style, goal poacher. Get him in! Look, West Ham fans will be disgusted not to be Burnley at home. And Vincent Company will similarly feel like angry munching on a stray pigeon for chucking away the lead. I mean, they are still 10 points from safety. This is all very grim. Bournemouth 2, Sheffield United 2. This is freakish. This is weird. Burnley and Sheffield United had identical weekends. Both go 2 0 up at stadiums where they arguably should have been smashed, only to both chuck away a two goal lead and ultimately concede a sloppy 91st minute equalizer to the striker who just came on as a sub. And again, two strikers who have a pretty big name. I mean, both Danny Ings and Ennis Unal used to play for Liverpool and Man City. You know, the biggest game in world football this weekend. Look, to be fair, I mean, Unal was never actually given a City debut, while Ings was embarrassingly omitted from a Champions League final matchday squad against Real Madrid in favour of Jurgen Klopp selecting Dominic Solanke, who skied his penalty on Saturday afternoon. It was such a horrendous spot kick that I wouldn't be surprised to hear that the ball had killed an owl perched in a tree across the road. I don't know. Are there many owls in Bournemouth? Or is it a town filled with pensioners who wander the streets like disorientated zombies, just begging some good Samaritan to change their nappy for them? Harry Redknapp, I'm looking at you. But yeah, Solanke's penalty. I'm gonna say something which sounds like a compliment, but those who know will know, it's not. Watching him take that penalty was like watching David Beckham take a penalty. If you can remember, you can remember. But lad, you all know that I glaze and don't eat areola. Is that the, the new hip word, glaze? Um... Craig Mitch said it when I was on the kickoff once. I don't know, it makes me sound like I just smear birthday cake icing all over Ariola's chin. But yeah, I, I think he's a top quality coach. But failing to beat one of the worst Premier League teams of all time 
at home is not a good look. You're showing me up here, Andoni. Needing a last minute equalizer to save yourself from an embarrassing, woeful defeat against a completely out of sorts clown shop team in free fall. I'm not angry, Ariola. I'm just disappointed. You are lucky that the Bournemouth crowd are such a nice, gentle bunch of old fogies who were probably up until 3 a.m. the night before stalking their grandchildren's Facebook pages. You're lucky they probably have deeper bags under their eyes than John Terry. Because if this was another group of fans, they would probably boo. Chris Palace won Luton Town 1. Play the clip! Crystal Palace 2, Luton Town 1. Palace win. I see absolutely no way for a Luton victory here. And let's put it this way. If Luton do win this match, then I will pour three buckets of melted ice cream on my head. Yeah. I was one goal away from this morning, having to shave myself bald to stop the seagulls being obsessed with my head. But I will also thank Luton because this is what I said about the Wolves versus Fulham match. Wolves won Fulham nil. Anyone who thinks this match is going to be exciting? No, again, if it's in the top three games shown a match of the day, then I will lick every page of a Harry Potter book. Yeah. Wolves beating Fulham was fourth on match of the day. Fourth. The game in third was the Palace Luton match. It's only because there was dramatic last minute drama. If Colley Woodrow had not scored a 96th minute equalizer to win Luton a last gas point, then make no mistake, Wolves would have been third on the match of the day running order. And so for the next month, I would be having to dig through my poo to find out which Weasley twin doesn't make it. Lads, it's quite ironic. Colley Woodrow seems like a completely insignificant word who is no more relevant than that magpie who had a heart attack on the roof of your shed last month. No, no, no. Old school watchers on the previous channel, which must not be named, they might remember that Woodrow actually caused me to lose a historical forfeit where I had to <laughs> join the boredom of lockdown, stuff my face with cheese from a bucket. Even now, my tongue still feels like a sour cheese string. I said he wouldn't score 10 goals for Barnsley. He did. I resented Woodrow more than Edgar Krabobble. And I remember that Simpsons episode? But here he is coming up trumps for Luton. And saving my weekend. How hilarious though. <laughs> Danny Ings feels embarrassed because his goal at the weekend was his first in over a year. Yeah, Woodrow's last Premier League goal was 10 years before. Weirdly, that was also in a draw with Crystal Palace, scoring for Fulham at 19. I mean, lads, momentum can carry teenage footballers, right? Even when they're about as naturally talented as the squash badger. I mean, Federico Makeda scored for Manchester United against Aston Villa at 17. And it's still riding high on adrenaline. He then scores again at Sunderland the next week. Woodrow was probably hoping for a similar impact. If you had told this Fulham wonder kid that he would have to wait a decade for his next top flight strike, if I were him, I would have panicked. It would be a bit like being given a 10 year prison sentence. If someone had told you that you're not gonna be able to eat a bowl of Frosties for a decade. Instead, you're just gonna have to constantly fish for broken glass out of your cup of gruel. Honestly, seeing Woodrow flash in that deft header from that expert Andros Townsend cross, even I'm happy for him. But that Luton wrote the lucky. Palace had chance after chance. Even Eperek Yedzi almost morphed into Zabi Alonso to nearly score from 60 yards. I mean, to be fair, there'll only be one person turning into Zabi Alonso this weekend, and that was Alexis McAllister. After having been kicked in the chest. Sorry, your name is Doku. It's not shorthand for do kung fu. I know he used to play for Man City too, but I don't think Doku should have been studying the book of football according to Nigel de Young. But honestly, Luton, what a result. Aston Villa nil, Tottenham 4. Play the clip! Aston Villa nil, Tottenham 1. I think this will be a smash and grab Tottenham win. Villa will get someone stupidly sent off early doors. Richardson will pounce and score a winner. Few absolute scenes in the away end. This is going to be Tottenham's most important win of the season. And uh, if. If Villa do win, because I have so much faith in Ange Ball not to lose such an important match, then yeah, if Villa win this mammoth game, then I will pour a bowl of mashed potato on my head. That Spurs prediction is awful, Lamau. Make sure it's a big bowl of mashed potato. That Villa versus Spurs prediction is interesting. Better put the mashed potato on preheat. As a Villa fan, he chose Villa to lose Spurs, which means we're winning. Get in, haha. -ha. As a Villa nil, Spurs won. Interesting. Why did everyone think that was interesting? You, you, you said it was interesting but i know what you meant you were saying interesting in the same way i would say interesting if i heard a crazy old lady down the local weather spoons telling everyone she had secret wings and could actually fly to the moon i said that tottenham would beat aston villa one nil and you all thought that i had the brains of frog spawn instead instead tottenham left villa park with their fourth four nil win here since december 2012 yes this is the fourth time we've seen them win four nil at aston villa in just a little over 11 years that is horrible. This is football heritage. 4 0 has taught them specialist scoreline at the stadium. They did it in December 2012, September 2013, April 2022. And now March 2024, wow. Tottenham were exactly what I thought they would be. Ambitious, brave, fearless, winning a game they could not lose. Villa only had one shot on target all match. But Villa are in trouble. This, this is the Unai Emery wobble. You can't tell me any different. This is a team who are weeks away from going an entire year unbeaten at home. They've now lost four of the last five league matches at this ground. Is Emery, is Emery 
a bottler. We have seen this from him before. Back in the spring of 2009, his Valencia team smacked Real Madrid 3-0 in May to sit fourth in La Liga in the Champions League spot with just three games left. They then lose two of those three games against Atletico Madrid and Villarreal to throw it away and finish sixth. I make no mistake about it. One matter. David Silva, David Villa finishing in the Europa League spots with those three world stars in their prime not good. In the 11-12 season, I have no earthly idea how he managed to finish as high as third with Valencia with just 61 points on the board because that run of form after Christmas, finishing the season with just seven wins for the final 21 league games. How was that enough to finish as the best of the rest? Yes, he won the Europa League with Sevilla in 2016, but I'm sorry, ending that season with seven defeats from the final nine league games? Not even Newcastle finished the season that badly and they got relegated in that spring. Sevilla were in the race for the top four until the final 10 matches before clearly placing all their eggs in the Europa League basket. If Liverpool had beat them in the final, and don't forget, they went 1-0 up, then that 7th place finish would be a disaster. And Emery is not getting no PSG job. By the way, let's not forget that he failed to win the league in his debut season in France, finishing 8 points behind Monaco. You know what the most embarrassing part about all that was? PSG were not even top for a single minute all season long. He had to wait a year to take mega rich PSG to the top of the French league. And that was after chucking away a 4-0 first leg lead over Barcelona in the Champions League down the toilet. And in the spring of 2019, he threw away the top four with Arsenal. Yeah, I mean, they'd won seven league games in a row at the start of the season, but after Christmas, they crumbled. They finished the season with four defeats in a row from their final seven games to wind up fifth. Yeah, he got away with that meltdown when he won the Europa League with Sevilla, but at Arsenal, that backfired because he lost the final to Chelsea. They bottled it. I mean, their last home win of the season came on April Fool's Day. That isn't good enough if you want top four. And Villarreal, again, great start. By December, in his debut season, he had broken the club record of 18 matches unbeaten. Sounds a bit similar to the Villa run, right? And they then slipped from fourth to seventh, peppering their spring with plenty of defeats. I don't mean to scare the Aston Villa fans, but I think Emery gets massively distracted by the European competition that he's in. I think this week, he will have spent it obsessing over Ajax. He'll have spent more time thinking about Jordan Henderson in the bath than he will have the game plan of Spurs. I believe that Emery is a quality manager. Yeah, but he takes his eye off the ball. I think this man is so obsessed with winning cup trophies that almost every time he's in one, the league form suffers as a result. The league form isn't his priority anymore. So honestly, Phil, I hope you win the Europa Conference League for your own sake, because otherwise, this is going to be seen as a horrible bottle job campaign. Man United 2, Everton 0. Nothing much to see here. Just Everton once again huffing and puffing and showing absolutely zero end product. The toughies were not even bad in this match. They just couldn't finish. And stupidly fouled Alejandro Garnacho in the box twice. Ozzy, after building in a stunning bicycle kick and winning and now winning two penalties against them. Everton fans are never going to want to see this blonde demon again. Well, as the most shocking thing about this match to me is that Bruno Fernandes became the club's all-time top penalty scorer with 29. Has he really scored 29 penalties? And he could have made a 30, but he gave the next pen to Marcus Rashford to score. I mean, remember, he was given a penalty against Everton earlier in the season to kickstart his campaign. And... It didn't. Brighton 1, Nottingham Forest 0. Play the clip. Brighton 0, Nottingham Forest 3. I think Forest are going to be devastating on the counter-attack. Don't get me wrong. Brighton will have more than 60% possession of the ball. And if they don't, then I will pour 10 yogurts on my nose. But Forest will catch them on the break repeatedly. Anthony Alanga and Calamon Sanoi will rip them to shreds, sharing the goals. And yeah, that'll be the Barcelona Chiefs very quickly deleting the Zerbi's number from their phone. Nuno Santo has himself to blame. Don't get me wrong. I am relieved that Brighton squeaked over 60% possession of the ball. But I also said the Forest would be devastating on the counter-attack, hitting Brighton with the pace of Hudson Odoi and Alanga. And so Santo naturally chose to leave both on the bench. Why? I know this is a man who was coaching Karen Benzema just three months ago. So he obviously knows more than me. But even I can tell you that having those absolute speed monsters on the pitch would have done far more damage against a brittle out of form crisis club Brighton than just letting Divacarigi let the host off the hook by missing a bunch of chances on the wing. I'm sorry, Santo, but you are the reason the Forest lost this match. Wolves 2 Fulham 1. I'm just relieved this match was in third, a match of the day. Anyway, that's the end of you lads. Don't worry, couch forfeit coming either tomorrow or Wednesday. It is coming. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I didn't have to do any forfeits this weekend. I got away with it this week. Yes, get in there. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give a like, share, and subscribe. But as always, I'll talk to you in a while.